Let's call upon our king. Blessed are the people who know the sound of the shofar. In the light of your countenance, so Yahweh shall they walk. Baruch atad and Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshianu, Bevisito Vitzivanu, Lishmoach Chol Shofar. Blessed are you, O Yahweh Elohim, King of the universe, who sanctified us by, your, by his commandments and has commanded us to hear the voice of the shofar. Yeshua said in Acts 1, you, you guys may have gotten the email that Yeshua um, gave them their last thing to be witnesses. Go and be endued with power so that you may be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And that is a commission that he gave us. Actually, today. He gave that to those people in Jerusalem standing there with him. And that's a commission. And then they watched him ascend into the throne. And now we, we have witnesses. If you believe the word is true, we have witnesses that saw him ascend to the throne. So when we get our scriptures and John the Revelator says, Behold, I heard the one sitting on the throne saying, The tabernacle of Elohim is among men. We can believe it because there were witnesses in Acts 1 to his ascension into heaven eight days later in Shavuot. Amen. To proclaim freedom. All together, blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to count the Omer. Today is the 42nd day as well as six weeks of the Omer. Elohim, be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O Elohim. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O Elohim. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. Elohim, our Elohim, blesses us. Elohim blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Amen. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Leolam Vayim Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Who <laughs> 
Hooktoftamel Messes Old Beteko, who visha reko, we have to reko kumoka. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Hey, right, let's all point our hands to the treasure and chest and uh, Tesher's going to lead us. Abba, open their eyes to receive your truth and your shoes name. Amen. Amen. And let's all together say, by his grace, not one will be lost. May we protect and defend Sabbath
my people, for I am their God, in truth and in righteousness. So if y'all stand, we do the blessing for the third portion, and we'll do the Torah blessing, we'll get started. All together, you shall say before Yahweh your Elohim, I have removed the sacred portion from my house, and also have given it to the Levite and the alien, the orphan and the widow, according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of Yahweh my Elohim. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven, and bless your people Israel, and the ground which you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey, as you swore to our fathers. Amen. Adonai, humble rock. Baruch Adonai, humble rock, le'olam v'ayin. Baruch Adonai, humble rock, le'olam v'ayin. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Asher b'kah b'nimi kol ha'amim. V'natan l'nu et torato. Baruch Ata Adonai, noten ha'torah. Amen. Bless Yahweh the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Yah, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Let's go to Exodus chapter 24. We're going to park there. Um... You may want to also, as we're naturally been going through the counting of the Omer, we know and we realize and we believe we've always taught this and we understand that as we come into the Passover season, the Omer time is a connection, it's a journey that's bringing us all the way to Shavuot. And there again, just real quick, Passover, the blood, um, we see where... The blood was applied to the doorpost, the lintel, the threshold, delivered out of Egypt. The whole idea was, was to bring us out of sin, to bring us out of Egypt so that we can worship Him. That's what He's created mankind to do. He created Adam to do that, and He created Eve to do that and the offspring. But as we well know, we sort of goofed along the way. <laughs> and so, and sin has hindered what we were created to do. Because now, instead of walking by the Spirit, which should have been so easy to do, this thing called flesh hinders us in our walk. 
And it's always pulling on us to do what we want to do rather than what Yahweh desires for us to do. And it's evident today as we go through life, as we look around, we see all the chaos, we see all the evil that's around us. And here's the deal. Guys, you cannot legislate morality. Can't do it. You got laws, we got laws, and we got laws, and you got laws. And then every time something bad happens, you make another law. The thing about it is, is the wages of sin is death. Yahweh has something in His Word. And whenever He would say that you broke a certain law, there was a certain penalty. When you turn around and say your penalties don't work, then guess what? There's no justice. There's no judgment. Then there's just lawlessness. And even He talks about in the end days where we're at, it's not so much a famine for toilet paper or food. It's a famine for His Word. And His famine is rampant because now we have a situation in our life to where people are redefining words. They can't even use pronouns anymore. You know, you can't even distinguish a male from a female. You have to call them its and thems and thuses and thous and whatever you want to do. I mean, we're like nuts with chocolate all over it just to make us where we can eat it. It is crazy. So with that said, Yahweh is still in control. He was in control whenever He brought the flood during Noah's day. And I'm going to tell you, the hope of this whole picture is this, that many times when He could have just started over, and over and over, he would find a few people righteous that did not bow their knee to Baal. They did not bow their knee to the system and all of the above. He has a remnant today that's still not bowing to this system. And until these people learn, and unless you're going to worship him the way he desires to be worshipped, then you're going to have this evil. There's famines. There's four altar judgments. These, these altar judgments are just going to come down on the people of disobedience. And that's just the way it is. So with this, as we're going, because this is as we're heading to Shavuot, as He has delivered us and brought us out of Egypt, we were supposed to leave Egypt there. And now as we're coming out, in, verse, in chapter 24, verse 1, this is really about ratifying the covenant with Israel. He's gone through, he's, he's gone through these days, as we have mentioned already, this is Ascension Day. This is a day when Yeshua ascended. And He is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And as we cry out to Him in, in Matthew 6, when we seek ye first His kingdom and His righteousness, then things are taken care of us. We're taken care of. If we're seeking first our own ways and our own righteousness, guess what? Yon, yon. And when things happen, and it's just the way it, it seems to work. So... It, it's never changed. It's still the same. So here, this is this very... The Exodus experience that we have right here was really all prophetic showing Him going to Yeshua. And this is where I want to tie this in today. We know this. This is a season that we're in. I just... I just wish that people would just quit being too smart and just look at the Word for what it is and quit trying to say this is done away with, this is not. Because every time you start trying to ask the simple questions, well, no, I believe in that. That's not done away with. And you whittle it all the way down and it's like, okay, so what's changed? And there again, I have to say that it, it is the statutes. People believe that the statutes which is the Sabbath, which is the feast and festivals, which are the food laws and these things, they think that they're not relevant for today. But when Yahweh made covenants, He makes covenants. And, and it's up to Him, and we have to follow Him. So here's, we just fire off here. Then He said to Moses, He says, Come up to Yahweh. He says, You, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Okay, now I don't know else how to say afar, 
And so it's not that he didn't worship at a fire afar. Okay, I'm just saying, so I'm southern, so you just have to work with me. I hope I'm saying it right. Afar. Okay. He didn't worship by a bonfire. He worshiped from afar. Okay, a distance. Let's just go with that. Work with me. Okay, so the word worship here, it means to bow oneself down. This is, this is the whole reason of coming out of Egypt. Was so that we could worship Him as He desires to be worshipped. This is the whole reason He delivered us from sin. is so that we would worship Him as He desired to be worshipped. So you see that these men... Moses, Aaron, his two sons, and these 70 elders, all of these people represent Israel as a whole. This is what's happening here. So it's not just that they're there. They're there representing everybody else in the camp. Okay? It's not just them. They're also representing. Yeshua, when He died on the cross, did He die just for Himself? Or did He die representing us? You see how this works? There's a representation here. This is prophetic. Showing forth to Yeshua and what He's going to represent. So even though these 70 and and Moses and these other three, you know, even though you think it's just them, it's not. It's all Israel's there. So we, Israel has a, a stake in this and so do we. This is what He's talking about. So worshiping means to bow oneself down, to sink low or depress. In other words, um... It's no different than in Revelation 1.17 where whenever John, remember we talked about him, when he saw Yeshua in Revelation, there's something he did. He fell face down. He fell down. This is a worship. This is he fell down at his feet as one dead. So this is that worship. Verse 2, Moses alone shall come near to Yahweh, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. So, This is painting a picture of what I want to teach today about Yeshua. So Moses is coming near. The rest of them are staying. This is a pattern. Okay, now, Moses, in verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh. Okay, Moses came and told the people all the words of Yahweh. These are not Moses' words. We getting this? These are Yahweh's words. And He told them all the rules. Let's go to John. Hold your finger there. Let's go to John chapter 12, verse 49. So Moses, Yahweh gave him instructions. Moses comes down and he tells the people all the words of Yahweh and all of the rules. In John 12, 49, this is Yeshua speaking. He says, For I have not spoken on my own authority. It's like, where did you get this from? But the Father who sent me has Himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. So guess what? Yeshua did the exact same thing. He presented the very words of Yahweh to the people and the rules. He didn't come down saying something different. This is why the Jew, our Jewish brothers have an issue when we change times and seasons and, chime, and times in law. When you do that, then they're saying, oh, you're saying Jesus did this? Well, then evidently Jesus is not saying what the Father says. And this is why they have such a repulsive against Christianity. is because they're saying, well, the same person you're saying who is the Messiah is not saying the same thing that Yahweh told Moses. But he is. And he said the same thing. It's just man changed it. Not Yeshua didn't change it. And he says, whatever Yahweh said for me to speak is what I'm speaking is what I'm saying. For I know that this commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So it proves right there that Yeshua didn't come down here saying something. He didn't reinvent the wheel. He is saying the same thing that Moses has said. Now let's go back to Exodus. Just want to throw that in there to let you guys know that Yeshua and Moses, whatever Yahweh was telling them, they were telling the people. They're not different messages. So the rest of verse 3, it says, All the people answered with one voice, they're in a cod, and they said, All the words that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. You know, it's funny because we, we don't definitely don't have time to go there, but 
I don't know how many times, like with Korah, how many times did Moses get challenged like it was his words? But they even made the, the, they even acknowledged here all the words that Yahweh has spoken we will do. But you know what? Usually when we don't want to do what Yahweh tells us to do, we start blaming other people. We start blaming, you know, other ministries or other whatever. Now, if we start saying other things that Yahweh didn't say, then we need to be blamed, okay? Verse 4, And Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. Today, these very words are written on our hearts and our minds. He rose early in the morning and he built an altar. Every time something happens like this, an altar is very, very important. You'll see it through Scriptures. Anytime that... Angels came to Abraham. What did Abraham do? He built an altar. You build an altar because an altar is covenant ceremony. That's what this is about. This is about covenants and about ceremonies of making a covenant. So you see here that he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And here's the thing. He didn't just represent the 12 tribes of Israel, but all the other nations that came out. It's just understood that they attached themselves to the children of Israel. Okay, so verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, I'm just going to paraphrase this part. These are offerings that were offered on this altar. But what's very interesting here is this, is that in verse six, when, in verse 5, when he took the offering of an oxen and he killed it, he took blood, he put it in a basin, he put half of it, and he threw it against the altar. So this shows you that Yeshua, this speaks of his death. It shows that he was on this altar. This is important. Listen to what he's saying here. Half of the blood he threw against the altar. I believe this, my opinion. Remember when Miriam uh, went to the garden and he thought she, she thought she was speaking to the gardener? And, he, and then she realized it was Rabboni, Rabbi, Yeshua. And he says what? Don't cling to me because I have not ascended, I believe because Yeshua, He died and He shed His blood. There's an altar in heaven. There's a tabernacle in heaven. Whatever's on this earth is a mirror of what's going on in heavens. It's just the heavens is way more spectacular than what was on earth. But Yeshua had to take His blood and go and put it on this altar. The reason why I believe that is because of this scripture here. It says that He took half of the blood and He threw it against the altar And then what did he do? Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. And then they said, all that Yahweh has spoken we will do, we will be obedient. And then look what he did. And Moses took the blood and then what did he do with it? He threw it on the people. This is why I believe this is speaking forth Yeshua of exactly what had to happen with him that whenever he took his blood, his blood... And in the water that came from his side purified the altar in heaven. It purified the earth because it ran down to the earth. And it purifies us. This is the whole picture of this is why Moses was doing what he was doing. It was showing forth. This is why whenever Yeshua came the first time, they should have recognized what he was doing. But they didn't see it. They didn't understand it. This is why... When we miss these things in Scripture, how are we going to recognize the second coming? You got to understand what Shavuot, I mean, what all the feasts are, but especially Sukkot. You got to understand what all of this is about. And really, Shavuot, you got to understand what that's about. So you see here where they threw it against, uh, he threw it on the people, and he says, Behold, the blood of the covenant that Yahweh has made with you in accordance with with all of these words. Verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders, they went up. Now, what does your Scripture say in verse 10? The first few words. And they saw who? They said they saw Elohim of Israel. They saw Him. They saw Him. Let's go to Deuteronomy 4.15 4.15 See, when we're reading the Scriptures, and this is what we try to go through in our Wednesday night classes, is we try to make sure that we cover all the bases. Because if you don't, you can sort of get a little bit mixed up. So, Deuteronomy, 
and I don't have it up here on the board. I don't know why I didn't write it up here. Deuteronomy 4.15. Now, Deuteronomy 4.15, we know that this is the retelling of the Torah and the story, right? Okay? Deuteronomy 4.15 says this, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. What does it say? Since you what? Since you saw no form on the day of Yahweh when He spoke to you at Horde in the midst of the fire. All right, now the question is, did they see Him or did they not see Him? That is a yes. It is a yes because when you look in the Hebrew, it, the word saw, it means perceived or vision. So they didn't actually see Him because Moses, we know, didn't even see Him. He put his hand over him and he saw his backside. So all of a sudden, see how we can read things and we can just grab a scripture and say, well, this is what it means. But then here it says that they, they saw no form. This is important because of what's going to happen a little bit later in the teaching. So they saw no form on the day, and this is the day that he was talking about, was this exact moment in Exodus 24.10. And there's a reason why he didn't let them see his form. It's the next verse. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in any form or figure in the likeness, male or female. Because guess what they would have done? They would have made an image. I promise you they would have made an image. Now, some of you guys that are studiers, you know, um, look this up if you can. I looked it up. I spent over an hour on this, and then I just had to quit. So some of you that like to really dig, do this. My thing was, is when I was reading this, I went, I just picked Zeus. I just picked Zeus. And I wanted to know, and the reason why I picked Zeus was because we know on the mountain there's a cloud, there's thunders, there's lightnings and all that. Remember the story? I'm not going there. See, that's what Zeus is known for in the Greek mythology. He is known for thunder and lightning and all of that. So I picked him and I, and I said, where, and here's, here's what I wanted you to, if y'all want to try this, if you do, you can send it to me. I wanted to know who was the first person who made that image. How do you know what he looked like? Who was the first one that done a painting of him or done the, I couldn't find it. They will tell you and they will make it like he is all from the beginning. And he's not from the beginning because when you read the history of him, he was born, he had a father and mother. And that's a crazy story in itself that I won't get into. But so my thing is, is how, who was the first one who made this graven image of Zeus? Because man has this desire to make an image and worship it. And Yahweh knew that. And He knew that he, you can't put Him in a stone. You can't put Him in wood. You can't put Him... Because He's omni... He, you just, you just, there's no... His glory is so beyond our comprehension. There's just no way to, to... You can't contain that. And so this is why I thought this was interesting, just to throw it out there. Because in verse 10, when I said, and they saw Yahweh, or Elohim, and then over here it says, they did not see Him, but yet this word saw here, it, they perceived Him or in a vision. Alright, so now let's go back to verse 11. Or really, let's go back, I'm sorry, to verse 10. Because there's something interesting here. There was under His feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone. Now, sapphire is the color of blue. It's a, it's a beautiful blue color. And it says, like the very heaven of clearness. Okay, so here, I saw this thing about sapphire stone, and it was interesting, because I got on verse 10, did they see, did they not, what are they talking about? And then under his feet, they saw sapphire stone. What was that? Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 25. 
And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads when they stood still. They let down their wings, and above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne. In appearance, we know what appearance is. In appearance like what? Sapphire. And seated above the likeness of the throne was the likeness of a what? Of a man. Human appearance. Wonder who this might could be. <laughs> yep. And upward from what had the appearance of the waist, I saw, as it were, gleaming metal. Like the appearance of fire. Is this like maybe a revelation <laughs> type deal whenever they, they see him in revelation? A fire enclosed all around. And downward from what he had the appearance of his waist, I saw as the appearance of fire and that there was brightness all around him. Verse 28, like the appearance of a bow that is in a cloud on the day of rain. So that the appearance, I don't know how many times the appearance, appearances is all over the place here. Of the brightness all around, such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. Now, when we talk about the cloud, and we're talking about the cloud on Mount Sinai, because this is what we're talking about is Shavuot season, that cloud represented his what? His glory. It, just, that was represented his glory sitting down. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. So you can see here where Moses was going through some things in Exodus. This prophecy and what revelation and what Yeshua was. This is like you can't make this stuff up. Amen. This is Yeshua. And this is what they were saying. Appearances, appearances. Without seeing an actual form, you're still seeing these prophets. Seeing the appearances of what's happening prophetically. Okay, so go back to Exodus 24. I know I'm jumping everywhere, but y'all just jump. Do a little exercise. Okay, verse 11. And it says this, He did not lay His hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld Elohim, and they ate and they drank. Eating and drinking means that they're sealing a covenant. That's really what this means. And what are they eating and drinking? Well, they, they had an oxen that they killed. And so these people, these men, Moses, his sons, Aaron's sons, and, and the 70 elders, they're eating and drinking. And this is showing something. Eating and drinking. Eating and drinking. In, in Revelation 19, there's something called the marriage something of the Lamb. What do you do at supper? You eat and you drink. That's right, you break bread, you eat and you drink. Is this sort of like connecting how all of this happens? And, and the reason why they had to do what they were doing here is showing what we're going to be doing in the very end. This is why the Torah is so important. I just so wish when people say this is not valid for the day, how in the world are you going to understand what the book of Revelation is when it's all taught in the first five books of the Bible? If you don't understand it, you're not going to understand the book of Revelation. Because everything here is pointing back. What happened in Moses' day? Yahweh did this as a picture to show forth what's going to happen on these days. It's just, it's just a beautiful way of how he, He's doing this. Verse 12, And Yahweh said to Moses, Come up here on the mountain and wait here, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So it tells you that the Torah is our instructions. You throw it away, you're throwing away His instructions. We can't throw away His instructions. Verse 13. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to start jumping from Exodus 24 to Matthew 17. So we're going to have a little fun here going back and forth. So you're going to have to keep your finger in one and just go back and forth. So I'm going to let, we're going to start in verse 13 first. I just want you to see the parallels of how what happened during this time of what happened during Yeshua's day. It's exactly the same. And, there, and, and, and this is the reason why it was like this, is so people would know that after His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and after the Holy Spirit was given, 
We know that the Holy Spirit was given during Acts, during the time of Shavuot. It says so. So what we have is, is we do know that the Torah was given during this, this window of Shavuot. Okay? So we see from Mount Sinai, there's instructions, and now we see the Holy Spirit. Guys, without the Holy Spirit, you can't understand what the Torah is telling you. And I think it's very evident in the book of Acts where Peter is one moment saying one thing and he has to get behind me, Satan, and then he's saying the other thing, the Holy Spirit is revealing this to you. Peter's all over the page. But you get to a place to where in Acts 10, it had to take the Holy Spirit through dreams and being led by an angel to help teach Peter that it's not just about the 12 tribes of Israel, it's all the nations coming in. This is why you have the story of Cornelius. And you have these stories. All of this stuff matters. So what I'm trying to tell you is this. The Holy Spirit is hugely important in our life. Just like the Torah, you can't have one without the other. One without the other, you're going to go off in error on both sides of the page. And this is what we see today. We see people today throw out the Torah and they'll have the Holy Spirit. They may be Spirit-led and they, they have faith. And just like what we learned from Eddie, they fear Yahweh, they fear Yahweh, but yet they don't fear Yahweh. And then you, you just, you're hitting and missing at everything. You're just, people that accept Yeshua as their Savior, if they accept Jesus as their they love Yahweh. There's something that happened to them and they, they knew they were a sinner and they needed a Savior. It's just the five-fold ministry that's got them screwed up. Because what they're doing is they're saying, but they love Yahweh. They come in here and then all of a sudden, the five-fold ministry is saying, well, this ain't, this ain't, this is, this ain't, this is. Well, because I'm a this, this is, this is what you follow. Because I'm a that, this and this is what you do. Because I'm a this, you don't wear this, this, and this. And you don't, but here you can wear a little beige, but you can't wear this, this, and this. I'm like, what the world is going on here? And they're not teaching anything from the Torah of how we are to love Yahweh and how we're to love our neighbor and how we are to worship Him. And this is what we've got into, and this is the five-fold ministry's fault. And I'm part of that, and this is what I'm telling you. This is the five-fold ministry's fault. If they don't like it, they're going to answer because when he says in Jeremiah, woe to the shepherds, he ain't talking to the sheep. He knows how to say woe to sheep. And he knows how to say woe to shepherds. And shepherds are those that lead. So here you see, because it's just, man. Anyway. So in verse 13 it says, So Moses rose, he rose, Moses rose, with his assistant Joshua, or Yeshua, or Yahshua, However you want to say that. I'm just saying it could be maybe just the reason why his name was changed because it wasn't that. Right? Okay. And what does Joshua mean? Salvation. So Moses arises with his assistant salvation. Let's just say it like that. It's pointing to something. And Moses went up into the mountain of Elohim. So this is Yahweh's mountain. All right. Matthew 17, 1. Let's flip over there real quick. Somebody else went up on a mountain. After six days, Yeshua took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother. So James and John were brothers. And they went up, and he led them up on a high mountain by themselves. So on this high mountain, you're seeing that Moses goes up there with Joshua. Now you're seeing that Yeshua's going up there with Peter, James, and John, who represent the apostles. These are the leaders of the twelve. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Now think about this. He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Is that sort of like Ezekiel 1 that we read? How he is gleaming like metal and fire and presence and... All of a sudden, Yeshua from a human form, all of a sudden there's a transfiguration that happens in front of them. So y'all just track with me. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared to them, who? Moses and Elijah talking with him. 
I believe this. Remember in, in Exodus 24, this is all about ratifying the covenant. This is about he's making a covenant with Israel and all of those. That's what that was about. The eating and drinking, the blood, the throwing, the slinging. All of that is about that. Going up on the mountain, getting the judgments. What's happening here is, is now you're up on a mountain. Moses and Elijah represents the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets are ratifying a covenant. And it's the covenant of Yeshua because he's fixing to die and he's fixing to start slinging his blood on the earth and on the altars of heaven. This is the same picture. So this is what's happening here. This is a confirming of the covenant that Yeshua is fixing to make. All right, let's go back to Exodus, flip back to verse 16, 24. Then it says, The glory of Yahweh dwelled on Mount Sinai, and a cloud covered it for how many days? Six days. And then on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Well, let's go back to chapter 17, verse 1. What does it say? After six days. Yahweh knows how to say after four days, after three days. He knows how to do that. Do you think that this is sort of like a huge picture of what he's telling you that here is my son, hear him, is what he's saying? Moses goes up after six days. Yeshua, after six days, Yeshua took with him Peter, James, and John. All right, let's go back to 24.16. So we see here also the glory of Yahweh dwelled on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, now he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. When you go back now to chapter 17.5, flip. It says, he was still speaking. Now that he is Peter. While Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a what? A voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well. Please listen to him. So here, in, in 26, it said in, on the seventh day, Yahweh called. Here, Yahweh is calling. And he's doing the exact same thing. He's speaking to Yeshua just like he spoke to Moses. Okay, now we're going to jump to Exodus 34. So we have to go, and then we're going to go back to 17. So hang your finger around 17. Don't lose 17. Verse 29. And when Moses came down the mountain, or on Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin on his face did what? It was shining. It shone because he had been talking with Elohim. He was in his presence. Verse 30, Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses and beheld, or behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near. Now let's go back to Matthew 17 too. And he was transfigured before him. And what happened? His faith <laughs> shone like the sun. You can see the very shining of the presence and the glory that happened to Moses is happening to Yeshua right here. His face is the reason why this language is here. And his clothes became white as light. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 18. Verse 15. During this season that we're in, we can see how our Heavenly Father, when He does things, He doesn't just do things just to be doing it. There's reasons. You know, as we were talking to different people, won't name names, but different people, 
who are trying to understand really about the Mosaic Covenant. And I hate it when somebody says Mosaic Covenant because a lot of times when you say it like that, you're thinking that it's Moses that did all the talking and Moses did the writing down, like the Abrahamic Covenant and all of these things. They name it that because that's the period and these are the, these are the main characters who Yahweh was making covenants with. But he wasn't just making, he didn't make a covenant just with Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham in his seed. And that's why Galatians says, in the seed, which is Yeshua. See, the whole covenant was made with Abraham was to his all, all of his offspring and all the nations. But the main covenant was made between Abraham, it was between Abraham and Yeshua. And Yeshua is now, because he's showing a picture, it's between the nation and all of the nations. Those who call upon his name will be saved, will have salvation. But when that happens in salvation, the very Torah, because whenever the Exodus, the blood was first shed in Egypt, the Torah in the Holy Spirit in type is given to you after you've been saved, not before you're saved. It's, it's when you become in covenant, once you apply the blood and you start walking out, then there's a ratifying of a covenant that takes place. I know that there's people and there's denominations and it, because I was part of it, they have an issue because they think that obeying commandments is diminishing the blood of Yeshua. It is not diminishing. It is glorifying the blood of Yeshua. It's glorifying because these clouds of glory and all of these things, ratifying the covenants had to be done with blood because the wages of sin is death. There had to be blood shed. So you see here that there was blood over the doorpost and the lintel coming out at Passover, but you still see here blood of ratifying the covenant before the Torah was given. Because now he's throwing the blood. It ain't, because see, really coming out of Egypt was the protection of who? The firstborn. But now it's everybody. It's all of the people. And whenever these people back then was saying, whatever Yahweh says we will do, He's talking about the whole community, whatever He says we will do. We are saying the same thing today. The problem is, is because there's so many denominations out there and there's so many people saying so many different things and the blood's been applied, yes. But we got to get with the program of doing what Yahweh says to do. And if we don't get this, and I'm not talking about just here, I'm talking about us here, but I'm talking about all people that confess Yeshua in some form or fashion. we got to get together on the same page with Him. Because He's coming. And the thing about it is, is when we're thinking about He's revealing things about His coming even more today than I understood last year. And I mean, there's leaps and bounds of what's happening. About what can be happening still at Passover an unleavened bread season, and during this season, that's going to bring us into the Sukkot season. If we can sit here and say, well, these two have already been done, I can play around until trumpets, and at a lull I can start getting together, dude, you're going to be on the outside of the ark. Because now I'm understanding there's going to be things that's going to be happening with the greater exodus. It's like, I mean, look, a lot of times, this is a guy thing. A guy thing is, is we, we're, I'm, just, I'm just really analytical. I don't know how to spell that, but that's, I think that's what I am. Okay? In other words, I see this. I mean, to me, 2 plus 2 is still 4. Okay, I was going to get my calculator out. Okay, so it's still 4. So 1 plus 1, 2. I, 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 think, I think that way. I'm a simple guy. I try to think that way. And so what happens is, is just by... Thinking that way, you would think, okay, he came at Passover. This has happened. The Torah was given and the Holy Spirit fell in Acts. I'm good with that. So 
What's behind me doesn't matter. Now I will move on and I will concentrate over here because this hadn't happened yet. Well, when you do that and you don't understand that the greater exodus means what it says, greater exodus, where did exodus happen? It didn't happen in the seventh month. Exodus happened back at Passover. So if there's a greater exodus, maybe something's going to happen again during those seasons that's going to be very instrumental for here. And if I'm flaking around out here, and I'm talking to myself, calling myself a flake, y'all, don't, it, y'all might be Cheerios, I don't know. But anyway, so whatever happens. But see, in my mind, but do you know, this is how beautiful the Father is. He, I, I mean, He allowed me to think the way I thought. But when it come the time for me to be corrected, He corrected me. This is the beauty of how He works. Because when it's time, He will let you know when He needs to let you know certain things. And this is why it's called revelation. Revelation is something He's going to get us. Because you know what? If, we're not gonna, if I'm not going to walk out what I know, He's not going to give me, not going to show me, not going to bring understanding to me. Why would He if I'm not doing what He's already entrusted us with? So the beautiful thing is, is now, I believe, because we're getting closer, He is now starting to reveal more about the greater exodus and what it means. Because what's happening is, is if we don't understand and have this Torah and the Holy Spirit wrapped around us and functioning in us, why in the world, you know what we're going to end up being? We're going to be virgins but asleep, but we're going to be foolish and not wise. And that's where he's waking me up to these truths about... Now look, we, we bounce through this, and this is really fun. And it does show you that Moses... Because I'm going to read a scripture here. Well, I'll just read it here in uh, Deuteronomy 18.15. You know this. You don't have to turn there. Yahweh your Elohim will raise up a prophet like me among you for your brothers. It is him... Or it is to him you shall listen. Now, who do you think Moses was talking about? Yeshua. And then in in Matthew 17, verse 5, it says, He was still speaking, talking about Peter, and behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am very well pleased. Listen to him. Moses is saying there's going to be a prophet. Listen to him. Yeshua, Yahweh speaks it and says, Now, this is Him. Listen to Him. He's still speaking to us today. But do you know how He's speaking to me you today? This Torah and His Holy Spirit, His Ruach. And if you get in this without the Ruach, you will not interpret it right. This is why I played that little game earlier. And they, and they saw God. And they saw Elohim. If I'd have left it there, y'all would have walked right out of here and saying, you know what? These guys, they saw Him. Word said it right there. Black and white. Boom. Right there. But then what would happen is, is somebody that knew a little bit more than me would have went to Deuteronomy and said, you know what, Mark, that ain't right. Because it said here that they didn't see Him. You, you see what happens sometimes when we just grab something and we run with it? We need to vet it. We need to search it out. We need to understand when it says nobody's ever seen Yahweh. But here it said that they did. Something clicked. So something's not adding up. And this is what's happening. It's just that our English interpretations a lot of times, because see, they could have put the word perceived in there instead of saw. Because that's one of the definitions in one of the words. Or they could have put the word vision. I understand if I see a vision... I really believe 100% I saw something. But yet it wasn't in the physical. But that scripture there led you to believe that it was something that they personally witnessed and they personally saw, that they saw with their eyes. But then when you go and you see it, you see how... So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, and this is why I'm emphasizing this so much during these times and seasons, 
True worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. And I think what is, well, there ain't no thank, I know, because I was there. I was raised, you know, just Jesus. And that was really it, you know, just act right once you do that. You know, don't steal and don't chew tobacco and don't smoke, don't drink, because I was raised Baptist. If you do, make sure that put it in the back cabinet up at the top where the deacons don't see it when they come to your house to visit, that type stuff. You know, if you're Pentecostal, you know, you just don't shave, nothing, hairy legs. I'm just saying, hypocrite britches, um, no makeup, you know, no jewelry, no, can't tell what time it is, can't have no Apple Watch. That's right. You could wear a watch. Uh, no, that's your assembly of God. You could wear a watch. The other UPC, no rings. You couldn't tell if you if they wore a watch. They wore a watch. They were backslidden if they wore a watch, is all I'm saying. They were plain. Okay, a plain watch. Yeah, didn't speak, didn't, probably didn't even have a dial on it so it would go around. I, I wasn't, it, it's Timex. Maybe they had a Timex. There you go. But, but y'all, look, we've been there because I'm speaking to different people and, and our Catholic brothers. Man, y'all had it made. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Do a few Hail Marys, a few backflips, and just keep her rolling. You know what I'm saying? Light a candle. Light a candle. I know. they. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing us all in there. Because what happens is, is everything that I've been telling you has nothing to do with Torah and the Ruach. It has to do with the way they figure that you've got to find some rules. Now, let me tell you something about legalism. People will tell you if you're following the laws and commandments, you're legalistic. That is crazy. Because legalistic is telling you that you have to follow something that the law doesn't say. That's legalistic. When somebody tells you, thou shalt not wear mascara, that's legalistic. That's what legalism is. But when the, terror, the, Torah, the, terror, when the Torah tells us that this is food and this is not food, and when we obey, that is not legalistic. That's called obedience. That's what that is, is obedience. His spirit being poured out, Brad said this a few years before he passed away. That he believed that the gifts of the Spirit were going to come back in a way, a first century way. Not 1900 way. Not the time, but back first century way during Paul and Peter and during these times and these seasons to where like when Peter went to Cornelius' house and he didn't understand the Holy Spirit. But see, this is what happens to us. We're no different than Peter was. We're no different than Paul was whenever we come out of a congregation or we come out of religion. See, when Paul had his road to Damascus to spirit, experience, he didn't just go the next day and walk into a city and start proclaiming Yeshua. It took him a while because he had to get his thinking... There's a transformation that had to happen in him for him to understand what was the Torah. Because do you know what really he had to get? Now, I'll understand this. I want to. All traditions are not bad. Okay? Do, do, do y'all get that? All traditions are not bad. But traditions that, take, that replace his commandments are beyond bad. And that's what Paul had to clear up. Peter had to clear up the same thing. That had to happen to him because he couldn't eat with anybody. And you would have thought, I'm just throwing this out there. I mean, in Acts, Peter pretty early on goes and he ministers to the Gentiles. I mean, of all people, a centurion, a Roman soldier, the Romans crucified Yeshua. Okay, but yet the Holy Spirit, it's like, don't you know he had a paradigm shift? Because he had always been taught that don't even eat with these people. And you know the reason why I know that and I believe that? Because in the book of Galatians, he was sitting here eating with the Gentiles. Not eating unclean food. He was just eating with them. Fellowshipping with them. 
when the big boys came to town, he separated himself. Even to the place to where, was it Barnabas that was with him? He ended up separating himself, and Paul had to crawl that honey. Can I say that? He had to crawl him and say, what are you doing? This is not right. And Peter had to say, you know what? He's right. I choked. Because I'm just telling you the flesh is there. And when James and John, same ones that was up on the mountain of transfiguration, when they showed up, it, that, that thing that was in him, the teachings of all of that stuff that was in him just surfaced. And he separated himself. And Paul had to say, no, that's not right. So it shows us that we're not perfect. We're still learning and we're still growing. I'm just, I see so many great seeds and I see so many great things that the Father's doing for us in Revelation of preparing us more for the end times than I mean that I've, I mean, he's, I've seen him in ages. But, well, really never, ever. But, but, but here's the reason why. It wasn't time. So here's the message. If it's time, we better hear what the Spirit is saying to the congregations. If it's time, we better hear. And, and guys, I believe it's time and we need to start hearing these things. So what I'm trying to tell you also is this. Is that whenever we're ministering, we have to understand that they are people that don't know or not privy to what you know. Just like I wasn't. So don't condemn anyone. You love them and you find common ground and you be able to minister this word however you're able to minister it. And, and you let that seed go. Because it says some plants, some waters. But guess what? Mark and Tammy don't give the increase. Yahweh, and we have to be patient to let Yahweh give increase in people's lives. But we keep watering and we keep planting. And that's what's really important. Yes, Terry? That's right. We have to be able to discern that time of visitation from Him. But how do you discern that? If you don't have the Holy Spirit, because you know one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is called the discernment. And so this is why we've been hammering here with our young people over the last couple of years. If you can't operate in the fruit of the Spirit, you will never operate in the gifts of the Spirit. You will misuse the gifts. Because these gifts are called power gifts. These gifts is the very gifts that Peter and, and Paul and all of them operated in. And do you know what? That's given to me and you. That's not been withheld from me and you. But Yahweh knows us. And if we will say and do what He says, can He trust? And this is really what He's saying today. Can He trust me and you with His Word? That we will give the people His Word and not our doctrine. Or not our opinion about His Word. Or what we think about His Word. Can we give Him His Word and give it to the people? Because really and truly, it's His Word that's going to unlock the key of everybody's heart that we ever minister to. It's not going to be my Word or how I think that I was able to explain it or whatever. It's His Word that sets us free. It's His Word that's always set us free. And this is why I believe... Personally, like with Moses, sometimes we're going to get accused of saying something we didn't say. This is your word. No, this is Yahweh's word. And I hope and pray here that that's what we do. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you and we just praise you for this portion. And Father, the parallels are just unbelievable. We do know, speaking to the choir here. But Father, at the same time, we don't have the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives like we need to have. Father, we need your power, we need your ruach, we need your spirit. These feasts and festivals aren't here just for us just to have a good time to eat and drink. These times are for us to learn and for us to be able to be ambassadors be your witness here on this earth. And to be able to declare your gospel. To declare your glory with signs and wonders and powers. 
And so, Father, I just pray that as we're approaching Shavuot, Father, on that day that when we meet, Father, that in our lives, even before we get there, that we will hear the rumbling of thunder and that we will see your glory cloud fall upon your people during the counting of this Omer. And, Father, that whenever that day happens to be here, Father, whatever you need to take place, may it take place in a magnificent way. And, Father, may we glorify you and honor you because these are your set-apart times, and these are times where you set the table and you invite us to the table. So, Father, not just here, but congregations that are celebrating Shavuot all over the world and places where there's war and there's famine in different places. Father, may your glory fall on all people. And Father, we lift you up and we praise you for it. In Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Thank you, guys. All right, all together. Sound the great shofar for our freedom. Raise the banner to gather our exiles and gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Praised are you, O Yahweh, who gathers in the dispersed of your people, Israel. Amen. Call them in. Prayer for the United States of America. Abba, Father, giver of life, we pray for and entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock on which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of life, liberty, and blessings. We cry out this land to be reclaimed for your glory. May it be that you will dwell among your people. Send your spirit to touch and open the hearts of our nation and its leaders to seek your will and your ways. Grant us the ability and courage to stand for the truth. And may we be that righteous nation you have called us to be. We ask this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Prayer for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, all together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of Yahweh. An ordinance for Israel, to give thanks to the name of Yahweh, for there thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of Yahweh our Elohim, I will seek your good. The Aaronic benediction. Yivarecha ka'adonai v'yishmarecha Yaher adonai p'navalecha v'kunecha Yisar adonai p'navalecha May Yahweh bless you and keep you. Amen. May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you shalom and peace. Amen. And it's time again for the Kiddush, the blessing over the wine. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Bore pri Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And the blessing over the bread. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. It is Shabbat. Thank the Lord. It is Shabbat.